Hello and welcome to the Byzantine SCOTUS. Today I have Dr. Jared Goff on with us to discuss uh, Peter Lightheart's book, Delivered from the Elements of the World. So if you haven't seen the first two parts of my review yet, those are on the main YouTube channel. But just to briefly review what Lightheart does here, he lays out a attempt to try and get a whole biblical account of the atonement. So he wants to look at how can we factor in the Old Testament to our account of the atonement? How can we factor in the actual narrative of the gospels to the atonement? How can we factor in what St. Paul says to the atonement and try and bring together all these different elements of biblical theology? And not so they're simply adding on top of one another, but that they're reinforcing each other and helping us understand each other. And I think at many spots, he actually comes to something very similar to Scotus, while at other points, he sort of departs off into something I think that's very contrary to a lot of the tradition. And so that's why I wanted to have um, Dr. Goff on here today to discuss that with us. So how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you. I hope you uh, had a happy new year and a very Merry Christmas as we move into Theophany. Well, thank you. You as well. And so, yeah, let's start off with discussing Lightheart's account of satisfaction atonement, maybe. So I think there's an interesting spot in the one of the appendixes where he lays out four different historic views of the atonement, two that he's critical of, which he lists Anselm and then uh, John Calvin, interestingly, and then the ones he's positive towards, which are Athanasius and uh, Thomas Aquinas. And when he lays out Thomas Aquinas as one, he actually thinks that this is essentially his own view, which is that it's Christ's obedience to God that uh, satisfies uh, God's justice. And, restore, and he specifically wants to focus on the restoration of justice to the universe by Christ's obedience. So I'm curious if you could compare that maybe with Scotus's view of the atonement. Well, yeah, I, I mean, I can, I, I can begin. Um, for um, for Scotus, um, I, I don't know where to where to begin, whether with the metaphysics or with the actual uh, discussion of atonement, because this um, relates closely to questions of merit, uh, justification, uh, and their and grace. In in some ways, especially with the formal reality of uh, grace as charity, and then in a sense ramifying through a kind of quasi or actual formal distinction into faith and hope, um, grace and merit are closely related to the concept of justification, such that in um, Scotus, when you speak of justice in the creature, you're implying that there is the operation of grace as charity, which also implies then uh, the notion of merit. And merit here is simply um, the rendering of the creature through an act of will, given the disposition uh, to love, or, or presuming the disposition to love in a, in a supernatural mode, um, that actual act that is uh, carried out by the will in the mode of charity that then becomes acceptable um, to uh, God the Father. So in some sense, merit, um, grace, and charity are related to or rooted in the notion of um, divine acceptance and the interaction on an interpersonal level uh, between wills. And so there's a kind of identity of will here or a commonality of will that then renders the created agent, one who is in a state of justification, um, acceptable to God. Now, getting back to the question of the atonement then, um, with respect to Scotus's uh, soteriology, um, I think what we have to do is go back and root it in his Christology. Um, <clears throat> And with respect to his Christology in the concrete, um, and I'll present here for the moment um, from a discussion of the divine councils and the predestination of Christ, uh, what, what typically Scotists have called the absolute predestination of Christ or the unconditioned um, election of the, the man Christ uh, as the highest expression of God's power and love and purposes ad extra, and thus the greatest glorification of man and the greatest glorification of God uh, externally or quasi-accidentally in the economy of salvation. Um, so getting back to the point of satisfaction or atonement with, with Christ, um, I think Lightheart, 
does a does a good job at outlining the um, discussion of uh, the so-called uh, pistis uh, Christu, the the faith of Christ. So, in a sense, here um, and Lightheart isn't really clear. I think he leans towards um, not really specifying or clarifying whether or not Christ had the um, infused so-called infused virtue of faith while in via, uh, because he discusses it in terms of both the objective genitive, which is more of an instrumental, if I'm understanding his argument correctly and the Greek correctly, uh, by, ha by having faith in Christ, one comes to justification, or the, um, the um, subjective genitive, which is really the faithful, the faith of Christ, which is a literal rending, uh, rendering of the uh, Greek, but it means more the faithfulness of Christ. And I think here, um, Lightheart is um, heavily dependent on certain work of N.T. Wright, emphasizing that Christ, in terms of uh, the faith that justifies, is ultimately the faith that is actuated in fidelity to the will of God, the faithfulness of Christ to the will of God um, as the perfect man who is the um, who stands both as the living Torah, the fulfillment of Torah uh, in himself, as well as the the second Adam in the order of time, while standing over and prior to Adam in the order of intention as the the true head of all creation. So in that sense, I think rooting the notion of the faithfulness of Christ, what, you, what you're dealing with is Christ's, in his humanity, um, his absolute fidelity and devotion to obedience. So it's this obedience of faith. Um, Lightheart provides a, an interesting uh, discussion of Galatians chapter 2, um, referring to the belief of believers or the belief of Christians, that faith that we have on the basis of Christ through the Spirit, the faithfulness of Christ as distinguished. So that faithfulness of Christ is the ground for the acceptability of Christ in his person as truly the fulfillment of Torah, uh, Torah the, the um, status as head of the human race, and thus by, by extension, all of creation. And also then Christ fulfilling this will by and through the operation of the spirit, which then through his, uh, his delivered it, verdict through the cross, and then the, 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 the justification or the rendering explicit of the status and personality and, and, and accomplished work of Christ through the resurrection, then the um, spirit then is given through Christ or by Christ in the economy of salvation such that we live in that same spirit. But I think what's interesting here is, is that you have a notion of faith that is already priorly, even, even in Lightheart's rendering, it's, prior, it's in a prior sense rooted in the absolute fidelity of Christ through his will in love of, a, of the Father. Ultimately, this obedience of faith is rooted in the human act of charity of Christ for the will of his Father. And I think on that score, then, we can understand why justification is both a juridical declaration, but a juridical declaration that in that same act of declaration renders one acceptable to God precisely because that faithfulness of Christ is already rooted in charity. And so in this sense, um, this opens up not to just a, a, an, ex an extrinsic um, forensic declaration, but it's a forensic declaration of the reality that Christ already was, that he manifested and worked out most perfectly through his suffering and death as uh, Lightheart describes the, uh, the biblical narrative, both of the Old Testament um, sacrificial tradition, moving into the narrative of the history of the Gospels, he does an excellent job of showing the kind of inevitability of the death of Christ as the perfection of Torah, that Torah that where Christ is the living Torah, and the um, willingness to accept a double condemnation, so to speak, that, that, that the discussion of Lightheart of turning the other trick is, cheek is quite fascinating because when, you, when you're slapped once and you don't return evil for evil, you don't engage the lex talionis, but you turn the other cheek, you in a sense wrest the initiative from the aggressor and the oppressor and thus fulfill the um, perfection of obedience and charity while at the same time reversing the directionality of the condemnation from the, uh, from the aggressor to the aggressed or the oppressor to the oppressed, back from the 
oppressor to the aggressor. So in a sense, the aggressor stands condemned by his own actions. And I think this is tied into kind of the biblical narrative of the inevitability of the death of Christ. And here, um, Scotus would, would not say that the death of Christ was metaphysically necessary, but it was most fitting, manifesting the wisdom of God, precisely as Lightheart argues, and very helpfully illuminates and expands upon the fulfillment of both the types of the Levitical priesthood, presupposing the fall, but also the, the types as they move into the life and ministry of Christ as narrated by the Gospels, as this inevitability of those who are under Torah or under the elements, uh, i.e. the Romans, but both under different modes of the elements or the stoicheia, as, uh, as the Greek says. Um, it renders both of these um, inert because, in effect, it manifests the weakness of the flesh the desire for protection, the tendency towards violence, the, the mode of operation that seeks the good of its own preservation over and against the activity of charity, which essentially Jesus defines as the love of God and love of neighbor. Um, and it shows that those regimes that are under the flesh are simply unable to operate within the spirit, but through Christ and his fulfillment, by accepting the condemnation, that double slap on the cheek, ultimately manifest in the cross, he shows the um, impotency of the fleshly order to ultimately satisfy its own longings, even for self-protection. And then by that resurrection, by the resurrection of Christ, Christ is therefore vindicated as the true um, Israelite, the corporate identity of Israel, um, in a sense, distilled or concentrated into its head, and at the same time, the full um, center of the spirit in the economy. Thus, you have the movement from the conception of the church, in a sense, on the cross, and the birth of the church already post-resurrection, post-ascension, in the descent of the spirit on Pentecost, or on the Feast of Pentecost as fire. So <clears throat> what I think is, is, is very important to note here, then, is that the faithfulness of Christ is precisely the faithfulness of spirit. And obviously, in especially Western uh, Trinitarian theology, then, the spirit is the bond of charity. The, the role of the spirit is to be that bond between persons, and thus is the um, hypostatic nexus of the love of the Father through the Son, which is non-egoistic while not being depersonalizing. And in that same respect, then, Christ manifests this in his human life through his human acceptance, his perfect human acceptance of the will of the Father through an act of charity, which, because his obedience of faith, his charity of the Father is perfect, it's therefore perfectly acceptable. But, but interestingly, then, the this is precisely moving into the realm of Catholic discussion and vis-a-vis -vis Protestant discussion vis-a-vis -vis, or with respect to the, the distinction between justification and sanctification. Whereas we see in Lightheart's account, there's already built in a tendency towards understanding that the obedience of the faith of Christ is already an obedience situated within a perfect disposition and then a perfect actualization throughout the life of Christ in the charity that is the Holy Spirit, or is appropriated to the Holy Spirit, is by the operation of the Holy Spirit. And thus, for Lightheart and for Scotus, they come very close to um, understanding that, or a, a common understanding, that emphasizes the initiative and freedom of God the Father in the order of salvation, that places uh, a primacy on the reality of charity. And that charity is made operative or is, is made objectified, in a sense, um, in the life of the believers in Christ through faith. So through faith, we know what to believe, but it's precisely through a faith that is already rooted in charity, which gives us this, the disposition to follow what has been commanded in an acceptable and meritorious way. So what we have then is that through faith, we are justified, but it's a faith that is informed by charity because it's already rooted in that relationship that the Holy Spirit establishes in extending the community of the Trinity ad extra. And the community of the Trinity can only be extended ad extra 
through interpersonal relationship. Because that's because God is in himself and infinite, and thus we cannot enter into the Trinity as such through essence, but nevertheless, through the unifying operation of the Spirit, we can come into relation to the will of God in such a way that we're accepted into the company of God by this act of charity that is empowered by the Spirit, giving us the ability to will in a supernatural mode, a relatively supernatural mode that is already acceptable to God. And thus, we see then the mechanism is that Christ, because he is a divine person, his obedience of faith is constituted or at least posited by his status as a divine person, assuming a human nature. Nevertheless, the Holy Spirit is given to Christ in his humanity and <clears throat> given through and by Christ in his humanity. And through that same spirit, then, we enter into this bond of charity that the spirit already has eternally established and manifested in the Trinity. So um, justification in this sense, then, is, uh, in, in Lightheart's use of the term, is, is quite insightful, deliverdict because it is a forensic justification about the status of the person, but it's not a legal fiction because the forensic declaration is based upon the faithfulness of Christ, that faithfulness that is given through the spirit to the believers that renders human, uh, the other believers in Christ acceptable to God and thus gracious or meritorious. In a sense, we, we get this sense when we, um, when we, when we use the language of grace, oftentimes we think of it as this kind of um, distinct category of reality or theology. But grace, in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in an etymological sense, just simply means something that is gracious or acceptable or lovable. And so when we use the, per, the, the, the term persona non gratus, right? This is a person that is not accepted into a certain company. But when we say, uh, uh, when we say that, a per, uh, that, that a persona gratus, then we say, well, this person is acceptable into a certain company. And it's precisely that acceptability, that company of the Father and the Son, that is extended through the ministry of Christ, primarily in the assumption of the human nature, but then secondarily, but not secondarily in the sense of uh, ontological importance, but in the sense of the outworking historically in salvation history of the mission of Christ is precisely the sending of that same spirit that spirit that is given, as uh, uh, the Apostle John says, I think in John 3 or 4, that is given without measure. And I think this is, this is the important part. So it's a deliverdict, but it's a deliverdict precisely because those people who through faith have been justified have also thereby been rendered gracious. And by that very graciousness, they are acceptable to God the Father through the, through the ministry of the Son and thus their actions within that context can be said to be meritorious, but it's already based upon the um, covenantal, um, sacramental, and ecclesio ecclesiological uh, basis that Christ established in his church. So I think, I think that's very important. So <clears throat> it's very hard for me to respond directly to each of the four types that Lightheart criticizes and then discusses. Uh, I don't think that um, I don't think that SCOTUS would have accepted any one of these particular models um, in, the, in the fullness without qualification, without his own um, understanding of what it means to uh, be graced or be acceptable. That would be prior, uh, that, would, that would take precedence. Um, but on the other hand, SCOTUS, and maybe we can discuss this a little later, or if uh, the opportunity arises, SCOTUS does critique Anselm's satisfaction theory in a very subtle and, and helpful way. So he takes on the main lines of Anselm, but he tweaks them metaphysically and theologically such that Anselm's exaggerations or perhaps um, potentially misleading formulations are thereby uh, blunted or at least mitigated. 